Hello, I'm Deidre McIntyre, again, with Black Blockchain Summit. It's my honor to be here. And we have a conversation today with um, Hassan Karim and myself entitled Enabling Voice Commerce Using Blockchain. So uh, I, I figured today, um, Hassan, maybe we do a little like role play before we get into the introductions in the background. Let's pretend that we each got selected by uh, Apple or Amazon or Google to be a part of a focus group, what will we tell them about their voice commerce systems that they should know? Well, um, I, my focus, my PhD area is in privacy. So I, I start from there. Um, I try to help organizations and research in the research community in general, um, sort of quantify some of the challenges with securing um, privacy. So some of the things that we talk about in, um, in privacy is what users, to what extent users will go to keep themselves private, right? Um, and um, on the flip side, to what extent uh, governments will go to um, uncover privacy, <laughs> right, for whatever reasons. And there's this um, constant debate, and, and uh, organizations understand this, there's this constant issue between um, security, national security versus um, citizen, private, citizen privacy. Um, so what I would um, go to the organizations and it would be more of a fact-finding mission, you know, what type of things are you doing to help um, advocate or enable individuals to um, take control of their privacy? Because even in the European Union, and this is um, an interesting thing, in the European Union, um, you know, you have the new GDPR um, that was supposed to sort of um, give control of citizens give citizens control of their data, right? And when we talk about voice, um, it is not just their, every, since everything is IP, then that's data, number one. And then the so-called metadata is their phone numbers and their call records, right? So that's not uh, bad. I mean, that's not something that you want out either. It's private, but here in the United States, they say, oh, it's just metadata and no problems. No, that, there's a problem. You shouldn't know who I'm calling. Um, <laughs> but in any case, um, GDPR by itself, although it, it is supposed to give citizens control of their data, specifically in uh, GDPR and throughout the European Union, the call tapping and um, they call it lawful intercept. Lawful intercept is still a part of the law. So um, although it now creates this sort of gray area that, um, that uh, telephone operators and telephone users, right? But um, phone operators, telecom operators, and anybody that is using the telephone infrastructure can play in. Um, and we're not really sure what's gonna be the outcome of that. So I would say be careful, but make sure that you give, um, that you enable mechanisms for users to um, protect their privacy like blockchain um, and they're, thereby enabling them to uh, take control like the law in California um, requires and the law in uh, the European Union requires. And as a matter of fact, other countries are, are coming on board as well. So I say give them technologies or enable technologies to allow them to, um, to remain, remain anonymous. So, so um, I'm going to backtrack for those who are not, who are new and not familiar with some of the terms. GDPR stands for what? And when you compare GDPR, Europe, the European Union's GDPR to what we have, our privacy in the United States, well, who's a little bit better? Who, who, or is anyone in the world better than both? And then we'll move back into uh, 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 voice commerce. 
Okay, so general data protection regulation, that is what GDPR is. And it, it's, um, it was, it stemmed, it, it's been this ongoing, um, if I wanna say, if I look at it from the view of privacy advocates, it started, um, private, privacy advocates started um, advocating for laws here in the United States back in the 70s. Um, and, um, and it sort of evolved from there. The, in the 90s, excuse me, in the 90s there was advocacy, but the laws actually hit the bo books in the, um, in the 2000s, like 2000, 2001, around that time where um, privacy capabilities were now required. Um, Sarbanes-Oxley and um, some of the other um, laws here in the United States, but they didn't, number one, they didn't have teeth and they weren't really trying to force you, they weren't like HIPAA, didn't, um, didn't specifically say they weren't prescriptive. They were prescriptive in terms of how to treat patient data, but not telephone data, not voice data, and not privacy in general. It was specific to health records. Um, and so it right, was yeah. with uh, SOX or Sarbanes Oxley that was specific to financial records. Um, but uh, telephone records have, I believe, intentionally been you know, left out because the government wanted to be able to um, have their lawful intercept um, capabilities and being involved in sort of architecting lawful intercept <laughs> infrastructures. I know what it can do. Um, I know what we can capture. I know the extent to which um, we can capture and thus privacy advocates are very right in um trying to push for things that can get back some of their anonymity right you we might not be able to well no with things like pro, with encryption um like blockchain based or something else I, I i'm even involved in research um looking at homomorphic encryption um to what's homomorphic encryption Homomorphic encryption is a, yeah, it's a long story, but in any case, it's a number, <laughs> another form of cryptography that um, is supposedly quantum safe, but that uses math that prevents, you never have to let go of the keys. So the, um, and there, there has been some research that use VoIP conversations uh, with homomorphic encryption. The typical encryption right now um, the keys are negotiated dynamically and shared across the air. So people, you know, let's say government agencies, I won't call out the three letters um, with uh, A, S, and N in their names, they can um, pick, up, <laughs> pick up the keys um, and sort of in real time, uh, listen and tap your conversations. Um, in the case of homomorphic encryption, um, you actually never have to give up the, um, the, the encrypted data is never, excuse me, the raw data private is keys? never sent. Or, uh, the private keys aren't shared, don't have to be shared, number one. Okay. Um, but let's say you wanted to share it, you just never have to um, have raw data out there. Um, not even when sort of like one of the challenges with TLS and SSL, where you're a SIP conversation right now, voice over IP, there is, if it is, if it is encrypted, then there will be a client and a server and the, both ends have to terminate the conversation. Um, and after it comes out of that SIP tunnel or after the encrypted tunnel, then the SIP conversation, which is raw, meaning your voice, is in that when it comes out and it gets um, processed by the end server, that data, for, if you were using homomorphic encryption, even that part never was um, eavesdroppable, if you will. Never, you can intercept it, but it would be garbly goop. So that's- So, um, it, 
So it, it, in in lay terms, you know, my, you know, Samsung, uh, my, my, my Google, uh, the voice, um, Siri on iPhone, uh, Alexa on Amazon, anytime you're having discussions around these devices, whether you're actually using them, they can be intercepted. Is that what you're saying, given the current technology? Absolutely. I mean, given current technology, um, the, the, they all go through data networks, number one. And unless somebody is turning on encryption, which the protocol enables, but it doesn't require, so SIP doesn't require it. Um, and the gateways are the ones, the, um, there are gateways that would um, enable encryption. And so um, if those gateways don't support it, then your everything is going across the network in clear text. I mean, in clear, where well, there's clear data. Let me call it like that, clear data. So anybody along the route can, um, if they have a tap, and it's not so hard to do, they could um, intercept the conversation lawful or, or otherwise. So we're not paranoid the other day when my family was arguing where to take takeout. And I was like, I'm not going for five guys, no matter what, da, 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 da. So-and-so doesn't even eat burgers. Da, da, da. Let's go here. And then I turn on my, uh, on, on Facebook and I see a five guys ad. that's not terrible. 100%, 100%. <laughs> no, it is. I mean, this is the creepiest thing in the world. I, I think that people should acknowledge that because you enable your mic, right? Mm. Um, because your mic is enabled and always listening, if you're going to say, hey, Alexa, or a hi, Google, right? If it's going to be listening for that, it has the mic has to be on. And yeah. if it is on, then it's just listening and trying to prepare for your next, the next time that it's going, you're going to look at the phone and look how creepy that is that, um, you know, you now have a five guys ad on your phone. We, and we rarely, if ever, go there. We, it was a big debate. All of our devices are out. We're, we're, we're a nonpartisan household. We have uh, Apples. We have Androids. We have PCs. Nonpartisan. <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> but every, everybody, everybody's listening and buying for your dollars. And I, I, I go on to Facebook, and I was like, what are the odds? We didn't, it's, not, it's not like it was tracking a recent purchase or anything. Right. So I can no. understand sometimes you do a purchase, and then you see, the, you know, you buy somebody's almond milk and next day, next day you see somebody else's almond milk. This right. was the conversation. It got shot down. We ended up ordering from Wingstop or something like that. And then I saw, a, and I was just like, I can't be, you know, you know, everything was out on the table. Nobody was using any devices. And next thing you know, there's that ad right there. I think for me, like one of the things, you know, aside from security that I would discuss, my concern is how, how close it is. I mean, if you talk about Amazon, Google, uh, and Apple, that's basically it, the powerhouses for your voice communication. And I was just playing around with Alexa the other day. No. Um, and I, I said, I, well, go ahead. That's not a, I mean, you're talking about, um, from you said Amazon, Google, and what else? And Apple, and in Apple. terms of so, voice, voice commerce, and so you're talking to devices to get commerce. you stuff. Mm, yeah, to get I, stuff. So uh, those I mean, three like, may uh, be being the at dominant player. Billion people use Alibaba stuff. China, yes, yes, we're in the minority if we use Alipay or something like that. Um, but um, in if China, we go back to um, don't discount. Uh, T-Mobile and the telecoms, the German uh, telecom T-Mobile or the AT&T, mm -hmm. um, although they are not, um, they're not out in the front where they could have been, but they just like, they're just too big to take advantage of, of um, voice things. They, I, and I'm not saying they should be, they should be, the right. should be out there. Um, but they are definitely involved in the infrastructure. They could stop the infrastructure if they wanted, you know. Yeah, but my, but my feeling is that it's such a small group, no matter what. Like, I just went to Alexa just for the fun of it, and I was like, uh, you know, Alexa, we're going to buy it on Amazon with Bitcoin. And she was like, I don't know. I was like, you, I'm saying to myself, you know. 
<laughs> but it, it sets the stage that, you know, she's not saying no, because Alexa doesn't really do that too much unless she's joking, being sarcastic. But it's this, if somebody didn't know, like if I didn't know there was another way to do it, they would say, oh, see, you know, that's why Bitcoin is trash because, you know, you know how much people shop on Amazon and I can't even because I asked Alexa. And so now you got this gateway that's sitting there saying, well, you know, we have partnerships with the credit cards and with this and this, this. We don't really want people buying with crypto. So this is the, the pegged in response to that, to that question, even though it may not, it, the actual functionality of it may not be true. So my concern in terms of having all these small gateways is that, you know, wider scale people of color, you know, what if I want to say, you know, uh, you know, I want to buy Ethiopian Tesla, or I want to buy, you know, a, a specific uh, Ethi Colo hat from Zuba. It's going to always be, well, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. So now you're restricting the commerce to certain players um, if, if, you, if you can't, and you don't know whether it's an honest um, answer okay. or if it's a deflection. Okay, I think that part of the part of, you hit on um, something that might need to be clarified. So um, let's draw a distinction between the voice platforms themselves and the voice commerce platforms, right? Um, so the the voice commerce platforms, you can enable voice commerce um, with a bot on any application you want. It simply happens to be that you know, Amazon owns the marketplace, right? And um, Apple, yeah, you have your Apple in your phone or you have your Samsung in your phone. But let's look at the broader world. Um, what is the, um, if we take those two and just look first at the voice commerce um, piece, you know, what chunk of the overall market does Apple actually have? Um, and the overall telephone market cannot be that large because of their, the, the, the here in the United States is large, but across the world, it can't be because it is um, very expensive. Same with Samsung, um, at least the, the latest Samsungs are bigger than Samsungs, but they definitely have smaller models that um, could, um, that do have similar features, right? Um, but I remember, and I, it was so sad to see Nokia get just like crushed, right? <laughs> but uh, Nokia had the rest of the world, right? Um, it was really, you know, I, I would be embarrassed if I were uh, Nokia. But in any case, they had the opportunity um, because they, they owned everybody else's pockets, uh, but they were too slow to move. But in any case, if you look at um voice commerce itself any any retailer could add that feature it is simply easier to do it um through a centralized uh commerce player like amazon or like whatever your phone is but you could stand up a website today and enable uh, voice commerce you don't need to go through them so what what is on the blockchain horizon? How is blockchain affecting it differently? Um, there's two sides of that. The payment itself, um, if you simply l consider Bitcoin as a type of currency, um, not fiat, but yeah, if you're going to use um, this asset called uh, Bitcoin and I, for, 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 for this part of the conversation, I am calling it a, just a currency, just as you would put USD or, you know, the pound, then you have BTC. So if you're going to pay in BTC, then you're going to pay in BTC. Um, there clearly there needs to be some back end, you know, tooling to make that happen. Um, but from a, uh, if you're looking at it from a commerce perspective, well, that commerce part of it could be enabled today uh, uh, by almost anybody. I'm not sure what you, what would have to, what is slowing people down other than being unsure of how to make it work, right? So when that first pizza was done, 
you know, <laughs> that that's first. the that was the question I was going to ask you. I mean, if it's if it's something that anyone could do, I mean, I think you know the thing with web development is like if you're a web developer today, okay, you know, okay, I could squeeze something out with WordPress or Drupal or Joomla or something like that. Um, but someone says to me, oh yeah, I want you know a voice conversation. I wouldn't even know where to go. I wouldn't okay, even so know what's a cure, what's best. I wouldn't know the process for that. I, I would assert that you probably don't know how to enable payments on uh, Drupal or WordPress either, right? Um, because far fewer people actually deal with commerce on those platforms. They, but, you, you usually just use WooCommerce or Shopify. I mean, use something packaged right, that you, right. you know, it's so if there's not a voice commerce package or a plugin, Mm -hmm. It's not something that those of us who are not, you know, I'm more of a project manager than a developer. So I know all the different products and, you know, I could dibble dabble a little light HTML and that's about it. But you figure most people are worse off than me. They don't know HTML at all. They're using Wix. So how, how does that become something for, for, for someone who's like, look, I have this idea and I want to get it out there and it's simpler. And I, I'll give you an example. There is a, a, and I'm not saying that they're not using this. Uh, they probably aren't, aren't, aren't using this, but there's a, a, a startup out of Philadelphia, non-blockchain related, called Black and Mobile. And they're growing fast because of COVID-19. They are, are basically a, a grub, grub hub, but a Black version for Black restaurants. So they're delivered to anybody, but they're representing the soul foods or whatever, whatever. But to go to an app and just go through, and okay, I want vegan soul food and this, 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 I would think that, you know, a voice commerce would be like, hey, yeah, I want that. It's easier than to just, especially if you're ordering some of the same stuff, you know, what direction would they actually go through to actually implement that, something like that within their, their app? I'm thinking. That Oops. Sorry about that. Um, I am right. thinking that um so without let, let's talk about mechanic the mechanics of it right you have your website and every website you want to have a payments gateway so first thing you need to look at is what um applications are there for your payments gateway um and once you look at the payments gateway then you need to filter for ones that support the currency that you want Right. Um, one of the challenges here in the United States is that most payment gateways will not, and even if you're going to turn on the payment gateway that enables, um, well, I, I guess I, I could see a way. Coin to, payments, I think, is the only one that does crypto, I think. So I mean, they might not be the only one, but they're one of the ones. Right. Oh, interesting. Okay. Um, so if you did, you would have to enable a payment gateway that in, that supported um, blockchain or you know whatever Bitcoin or whatever whatever blockchain uh, currency. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so you would have to you would have to find a payment gateway that supports that particular currency, and um, and you would hope that they had the tooling for it, right? But let's say they didn't. Could you roll your own? The answer would be yes. Um, if you wanted to say use Ethereum, for example. Um, certainly there are some um, Ethereum um, clients out there or wallets that would allow you to um, take currency from the internet. So. You could, you would just, the level of um, skill set that you need just increased a bit, a bit. Yeah, so that means I'm paying, a, I'm paying through the nose for the developer who knows how to do it. <laughs> for right now, for right now. Is there anybody that uh, you think is doing uh, voice commerce well and is using blockchain? I don't know, frankly. Yeah, I think, I think that, uh, you know, I've only seen talk about it within the last year or, or so. I would think one of the, the, the use cases, I, up until like maybe the end of August, I would have thought one of the use cases was, you know, to use Monero. But since there was some news that broke up August 31st about uh, a company being able to track Monero uh, payments, that might not be the case. 
any longer. But um, well, I mean, I'll tell you, know. you what. I mean, from my experience, the ability to track. I mean, I, I I'm a I'm a blockchain enthusiast, but I understand what the challenges it it has um, for people involved in tracking the money, right? <laughs> and. Uh, we need to be able to um, track, I mean, not we need to, so, there are entities that claim the necessity of tracking money. Um, and if you want to be sure, um, I mean, there, there's just these pros and cons, right? I guess I want to point that out. You know, you could have a solution out there, even like Monero, let it be trackable, but at least you could use blockchain. I mean, sort of, you know. Hey, I th yeah, I think, I mean, for me, like, for instance, I think people have a problem with is that the overzealousness of gatekeeping of the powers that be to censor. Not that, okay, I need to use a pri privacy coin on my system because I'm doing something nefarious. But, you know, at any time, the rug can be pulled from you right, because can... laws change and the laws don't necessarily mean that it just means I'm mad at this nation or I'm mad at, at this particular group of people. And we've all had it happen to us even, you know, in Facebook. I've been, uh, uh, you just fear for a second. I don't know what happened. Um, uh, we've all had to, to a situation that even, you know, on non e commerce social media. I mean, I've been I've been banned by um Facebook a couple of times, three or four times. And I was talking about history. African history. And I, I you know, three times I can't hear you because I think you're on mute. But um uh, three times I was banned for not being kind. Kind. And I I fought it each time because I was like, I don't use profanity in anything that I say. I just said she's incorrect, and I stated five studies to say why she's incorrect. And and sometimes Facebook is like, oh, well, we don't care. You you're you banned for 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 three days. So you have this overzealous uh, policing of black people in general, uh, you know, in the physical world, and you have it in a digital world. But now when you get into commerce or voice commerce. You know, what are the trigger words, you know, you know, what are black people looking to buy versus white people looking to buy? What are, you know, men looking to buy versus women used to buy? You know, what are the possibilities of biases that may be avoided by using um, blockchain versus uh, the current gatekeepers of voice commerce? Uh, I, I, I mean, I guess I would... I mean, those are very good and very interesting questions, right? I mean, we still deal with the the point of um, privacy, right? It isn't because it is blockchain that made it um, that made it that. Okay, so the front end um, of the conversation once you start a voice conversation like samsung has their voice bixby thing right so once you start that uh voice conversation um that is one side or whoever has access to the voice is able to process and necessarily process your voice and because they need to be able to figure out what you want right um Probably the problem comes is what are they going to do? What are they going to make their AI do in order to respond with what you want? That's problem number one. And then there is though, what are those keywords? What are those, um, what are those, um, you know, what, what could get you banned or more scrutiny or things like that. That's a problem with the voice technology. And I, I like to like sort of step back from that with this one technique that um, Edward Stoughton um, has. He says for his phones, he, he opened the phone and soldered out the uh, voice part of it. <laughs> so there so is- he's not using it at all. <laughs> Well, he'll use it. Um, it basically, he, he broke the GPS on it. I mean, he soldered off the GPS. And the um, he says, if I want to use voice, 
then I will plug in my microphone directly. And that's, Ooh. that's probably, I and mean, maybe people don't want to go that far, but blockchain or not blockchain, that is probably what you need to do. Blockchain might help in your uh, privacy part in the transaction, but the actual um, doing enabling voice payment requires somebody be able to process your voice. And that starts at the microphone um, that is capturing that voice and whatever platform, whether that's your phone, whether that's the computer, um, that one is going to be processing your voice and running the AI on it. And so that's really, whether it's commerce or just, you know, talking to your friends or just recording something, that's the, that's where, you know, more scrutiny is required from a privacy perspective. It, it, it doesn't really matter what blockchain is going to do on the back end. Yeah, it's, it's getting more and more uh, difficult to distinguish between actual voice and uh, AI. You know, you see more and more of this, the, the videos that they have where they're putting someone else's voice or, or, or actually stimulating a famous person's voice saying stuff that they didn't necessarily say. So it's going to be... Uh, you have that problem as well. It, I wonder if I don't. I don't know if you can answer this question. I wonder if people's voices are as distinguishable as a fingerprint would be. I, I, you know uh, what? I have not done the research on that. Apparently, it is. Apparently, it is. Um, and I, I say that anecdotally. But um, uh, I because. You know, anybody with voice editors know that you can go in and um, and modify and do, um, you know, you can do mods on voices. So I don't think that that is, um, you know, I don't think that we're going to find a silver bullet from a, from a protection perspective on that end. Um, it isn't, you can easily modify or modulate a conversation, even just adding background noise. Like, I don't know if you hear my son back there, you know, the fact mm -hmm. that he is there. Not too much. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it, it's interesting. Your ears don't, don't, uh, the, are not capable of picking it all up because zoom is doing a good job at sort of modulating. Um, and you could do that more, um, Um, so you, you can do that more, um, but it requires more AI. So that's the, the, the bottom line of what that is. The more that you're going to rely on AI to sort of pick up what you said easier, like, and be able to, you know, pick up on various dialects. Like how does somebody from uh, a black person from New Jersey clearly sounds different from a, a mm -hmm. white person from New Jersey and that might I'm sure anecdotally is true. Uh, I haven't done any research on it, but let's say, you know, how is it that the AI is able to, to um, discern your accents and still get the right words? Um, AI is necessary uh, to enable right. those capabilities. And as long as you have the AI on, then you're going to need, um, there's going to be, not you're going to need, but there's going to be the uh, opportunity for some players nefarious governments, um, corporate oligarchies or whoever to um, censor or to do something with your voice, whether it is to replay it, whether it's to record it for evidence against you, whatever it is. And I'm, I'm not a fear monger. I'm just saying these are the facts. This is right. the technology that we are enabling. Yeah. And I, I, I would hope that, you know, voice commerce, <clears throat> on the blockchain on more positive and would free up from the gatekeeping that I mentioned before. So I know you had a wider spectrum in terms of whatever, but I would love to say that I, I, if I want to buy something, if I want, you know, Jamaican blue mountain coffee, I want it going to a farmer in Jamaica. I don't want Amazon saying, well, you know, we got some in Cameroon, right. you know, or, or if I want something specifically from Cameroon, you know, I, I want something specifically from there. I think that, it, you know, those is that an experience that so you cool. had? Oh, I was just playing around with Amazon and I was like, yeah, I was like, where can I buy Jamaican uh, Blue Mountain coffee? And she recommended, you know, a Blue Mountain brand in, of coming out of Cameroon. 
Wow. Interesting. So it's like you get a redirect. You, you don't have specificity when it comes to our communities, but you can have specificity if you were talking about a certain German beer or something like that. You know that if you ask for it, you're going to get it. If it's in the Western world, you're going to get that particular product. But when it comes to, to us, there's a lot of substitution involved, which I would like to see, you know, blockchain solutions kind of make the world smaller. If I want something specific from a specific African ethnic group, I can get that. If I want that shuka that you're wearing and I want it from Kenya, I don't want a tartan from Scotland. You know what I'm saying? Right. right. I don't want the, I don't want the knockoff. Uh, uh, but I want what I want from the the people who who make it, uh, or the you know whatever, so that it can benefit their economy. I don't want okay. it to go another route. And then I think what probably the more um, the best thing that we can hope for is that organizations um, like Black Black Chain. Black, black blockchain will um, will become advocates for developers for us to stand up those kinds of gateways that will take you know that will deploy AI um, because the, it's the blockchain just think of blockchain as more of a pipe as the highway right mm -hmm. don't think mm -hmm. of it as the you know is blockchain going to do something more for me than just be a mechanism right now you have bitcoin it is a currency um, but it's just a currency um, blockchain itself can be thought of as the highway and or the platform of the infrastructure so there needs to be some capabilities built in that would um sort of favor if you chose if you chose to tell it hey i i'm pan-african you know just that mm -hmm. one click and like okay now we know Rather than send you to these first, we're going to send you to things that you might be um, more that would it might cost you more, but you're going to like it better because it comes from your right. folks, right? Um, and it is the AI, it is the AI, it is the AI that we need to focus on. Um, we need to. There's a book called um, um, Algorithms of color algorithms of color is a sister um wow what is that Ugh. um algorithms for algorithms of color um of oppression algorithms of oppression um man the okay. sister was really dynamic um when she did that but it the book itself it it, it really changed the dynamics of um of search engines, really, uh, Sister Sophia Noble, Dr. Sophia Noble, when she came out with um, that book, it changed. In as soon as it was published, then the I mean, it had immediate impact, and not by not it by itself, but through her advocacy. I think her PhD work, uh, but then the advocacy of it that resulted in the book. Um, the advocacy went from changing the algorithms that display porn on search results to now you don't see the porn when it, like if you look for, um, yeah, at whatever it was that you were looking, whatever you look. You could search, yeah, you used to be back in the day if you were for. searching, because I did a lot of searching for photos for, for like website development. So if you search for black men, something like that, it would reveal porn a lot early back exactly. in the day. Uh, but I was looking for people to fill up a website <laughs> that was not porn related. Right. So and and that was algorithm. really the algorithms of oppression. And as we um, quickly wrap up, I think that it, it would be good for everybody to um, pick up a book called Algorithms um, of Oppression. Um, and what's her name again? Her name is Dr. Sophia Noble. Dr. Sophia, Sophia Noble. Moja Noble, Associate Professor um, and African so, so from so from Alan Alan M. Taj to Sophia Noble, we need to right. get, we need to get on tap with <laughs> what our people have developed. And that's uh, okay, UCLA. Okay. Um, she's out of UCLA, UCLA. now, right? Um, but yeah. what she did was uh, phenomenal because she was in the right place to drive uh, for changes, and they made the changes. Yes, that's it. Okay, I see um, it. All right. And uh, she she made she forced Google 
to take a hard look at what they were doing and they went and changed their mm -hmm. algorithms. And these were real, um, they, when you would put in, and this is, it came up in the elections, right? Or earlier on in the Trump administration, why does it, why does it accidentally call them dumb or whatever it is? It was true, but. <laughs> oh yeah, they, they, they had something this summer that if you Google search and if you do it now, image search white doctor, you'll get mostly African-American doctor results. Like, oh, so the image search, um, I think that's as a result of the, literally this summer in terms of, of uh, you know, Black Lives Matter and everything else, because people were passing that around. Go, go to Google and search white doctor and see what happens. Um, and, and they, you know, basically, I guess, trying to push back against some people that were actually discriminating and wanted, wanted white doctors versus anyone else. And they put that kind of Easter egg in there um, right. for that to happen. I guess the, the overall, the point coming back to um, voice over blockchain, um, there is the technical side, um, which is a, um, you know, the technical pipe that could be used to make it, make your, if you will, make your conversation anonymous as it crosses the, um, mm -hmm. the, the world, right? But the challenges that uh, we we will face in terms of payment uh, processing gateways is the bigger issue is the AI that we use. And like you said, we have, there are these three, three big monopolies, if you will, but there are other w things that can be done, but that we would have to, in order to guide the conversation or guide the traffic to our own websites or to to give give you your blue uh, blue mountain coffee. By the way, the biggest yeah, consumers of blue mountain coffee is, are the Chinese or Japanese. Oh, that's amazing. It's, yeah, it is. It is. The Japanese, the Japanese. Japanese. Oh my goodness. Uh, I, I I was there and uh, they had blue mountain coffee. I was like, what? And when I was in Jamaica, they say, yeah, the people who buy it the most are, are from over there. I was like, wow. 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 Well, I, I went to Jamaica and I had it. Well, I was, I was married in Jamaica, so I had some you know, like there a couple of times. So that's the only just like, example that I can think of. But I think you, you hit the nail on the head when you said that we need to aggravate our developers. I know that, you know, the co-producers of this event, you know, Bit, BitHub Africa, you know, have the engineers here. And we're still trying to work to develop and to pull out of Howard and to pull out of the HBCUs, you know, you know, developers to work on projects. I think one of the stumbling blocks that's as, as, as finance. And you have people like, um, uh, you know, the mainstream brands that come in with money to pay students to participate in Panasonic or pay students or whatever. So if we say that we, you know, as Pan-Africanists want to bring developers to work on uh, blockchain projects that, you know, enrich or at least bring out of poverty, um, you know, countries throughout the African diaspora, we really have to compete on the level of uh, the Ripples and the Panasonics who come, you know, sprinkling gold around. Otherwise, we can't say, you know, the sweat equity is going to be enough, uh, you know, work for honor. We, got, we have to resolve that issue. We have to develop a strong work study program in which the students can continue their studies and, uh, and earn some food so they can eat in addition to uh, working on these additional projects that's kind of my thoughts on the development of blockchain from uh you know uh, in terms of getting more african americans or at least africans who are in america uh, who are at different schools whether they're predominantly white institutional hbcus to actually start building solutions otherwise we will have a situation where you know apple and amazon and google will dominate also in africa as much as libra is trying to run into africa and that's not going to be necessarily the best solution uh, it'd, be, it'd be a solution but probably not the best solution for um african nations agreed all right well it was my pleasure talking to you hasim uh, hasan kareem uh you know i've seen you at past events i've seen you sit on a panel whatever we never had some FaceTime, so it was good to really, 
you know, get to the nitty gritty of uh, your background and your concerns in terms of privacy. Of course, I'm scared to death now <laughs> to talk about, <laughs> talk about anything. I got to figure out how to, how, to, how to install my own microphone. But, you know, we have to have these conversations so that people can figure out. Or just accept watching. the risk right now, unfortunately. Yes. That's yes. really, but I, I think one of the cool things, and this will be my last statement, one of the cool things about blockchain is that at least there's some form of, you know, what do you call that, um, democratization that happens. It's not as much as you would want. It's not a panacea of everything that you want in terms of privacy, but you get a little bit back um, if you do things over blockchain. Um, but specifically with the voice recognition, that right there is a very active area of research. A lot of people are in it, if you can get in it. And so I'm speaking to all of the listeners, you know, get on voice recognition, um, AI, you know, artificial intelligence for voice recognition um, and be able to sell into the market to say, hey, I can do both recognize and train. So the issue is you need to train you train your algorithms on black voices and one, and then find some black vendors to, you know, sort of route the traffic to. That's it. Good luck. Exactly. All right. Thank you very much. This ends our uh, Baraza on enabling voice commerce on using the blockchain. Take care. Thank you all very much.